Do you seek him? You have found yourself among those who roll the dark dice. What you are about to hear happened long ago. A story brought back from the edge of oblivion, dutifully transcribed, and enhanced orally to better captivate your attention. Previously, the team set off for Milliter's Hope to find the town's missing children. Deep in the dead pines, they came across the mutilated corpses of animals, ritualistically butchered, and more unfortunately, found themselves as the focus of the Silent One, an accursed monster who finds joy in bringing pain to others. Now on their way to a campfire that might belong to the kidnappers, will the team's resolve hold up? Will odds roll in their favor? Fear the strangers in your midst. Never play games of fate. Dark Dice, Chapter 2, Mindless. All right, we need to get back on the trail before this happens to people who are tiny. They're called children. Yes. Kids. Of course, <laughs> of course. Sorry. Uh, Soren, thank you for helping us find more information. And, yeah, I think we should move on. I'll take the lead. This way, yes, Soren? Of course. Pleasure, Captain. I'll take a TV now. Agreed. Of course. Stay near me. Having stamped out the last embers of the fire and laid the corpses respectfully flat, faces covered, the seven adventurers continued along their track. They traveled for over a quarter of an hour, the stench of rotting flesh and pungent copper ever-present in the moist air of the dead pines. Rain fell, lightening the stench only slightly, but obscuring their path. Soren, having followed the path previously, paused to consider their way and the children's survival. As they paused, water pooling into the fiber of their cloaks, Soren continued, his path sure and clear. Sister Cavernsfall held her warhammer and shield at the ready. With every step, she scanned the surrounding forest, searching for a moving figure in the towering, dripping pines. I am staying on alert. I have my shield out still and my hammer, because we saw that thing run off into the woods. And I am not getting surprised by some creepy throat monster. <laughs> I'm right behind you, cuz. Just keep that hammer raised and try not to hit me. I can't pick up any sense to track in this rot. While the seven continued onward, Ias lurked in the darkness, his gray skin blended with the moist, dying bark of the trees, his curling horns protruding his branches, his attention locked on the forest and on the unseen track ahead of Soren. He viewed his fellows only in passing, thinking of his safety and that of his son. Rowena, fumbling over a tree branch, reached out to steady herself on her cousin's shoulder. The skin beneath her palm collapsed at her touch, and she did not feel the hump on Father Westpike's back, caused by so many years of work in the Dwarven Mines. She did not recognize him at all, what? but knew him in some way, the old, sunken face, long, pale hands, the height beginning to unfurl, his spine rolling up with cracks. Then, just as she ripped her hand away, the pale hand flashed across her arm, a dark talon unlike a man, dwarf, or tiefling carved into her flesh until the pearly white bone shone through. The elder's face phased, pulled tight until it lay shiny and expressionless. The eyes sunk further into their sockets, disappearing and the mouth shifted, swallowing up the short bony nose until only three dark, empty sockets remained. With a cackling shriek, it bounded into the pines, leaving the six adventurers confused, frightened, and in doubt of their sanity. Are you injured? Show me your arm. Ow, ow. The fuck was that? Ow. Look like a person. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Everybody stay together because if this thing can look like us, then don't leave anybody's sight, ever. Ow, no nope. shit. But which one was it? Who, who did it look like? I don't know. I just had like a sudden realization there were seven of us and there were only six of us. I'm pretty sure there's only six of us here. And then the thing attacked me. I thought, that's all right. Maybe it was just one someone I didn't recognize. But I feel like I did recognize him. He was supposed to be there until he wasn't. Ow. Ow. Where is Kor? 
Was it Kor that attacked? Was it a dwarf? No. Ravenna, was it Kor? Um, no. I thought he was with you. No offense to you, dwarves. Uh, but we have. He is not in the party. He's not around. Jeez. He. Uh, uh, um, no. Ice, are you still in the trees? No, I don't think it was anyone recognized. I'm going to cast cure wounds on you. Stop moving. Ayas, did you see which way Kor went? He fled further back into the woods. Uh, that way. Hello, please give me strength so I may spread the warmth of your life. Father Westpike touched Rowena's bleeding arm as a faint glow emanated from his hands. Over the course of the next minute, her flesh weaved together, the tiny strings of flesh bounding over and under in a loom of blood and light. The bone covered, the wound healed. Rowena flexed her fingers, her pain eased. You're my hero. Hmm. Thank Pelor. Um, please be I told still you for... you the coolest family member I have. Oh, that's better. Uh, God. Uh, Kor must have gone that way. Uh, Father Westpike, you are confusing us all. Who's Kor? Yeah, who is Kor? Kor. He's... He's the old man from the village. He was going to help us. Yo, no, no. Y- yes, Kor. Um, yeah, no, there's nobody here like that, Father. It's just us six. Kor's been with us since... Well, he's been with us since... Well, but I was talking to him earlier. He, nope. He, he, he's an old man. This person uh, has uh, never existed. You were deceived by wicked magics. So this might be the first time I've ever heard his name. He's never been in my shop. Never some old man named Kor. Not in Ilmatus Hope. Are you injured? Were you scratched in any way? He just stabbed me, screamed at me, and then pissed off. Obviously, he thought, oh, she's going to kick the shit out of me, which he was right, I would have done. But, no, no, I'm okay. Let me see your arm. Here. Seems like he stabbed you with a talon, though. What did it look like to you all? Kor is just an old dwarf. He looked like an older dwarf I thought I might have recognised. But something was off about him, you know. I also felt like he belonged in the party. Well, at least until he stretched back his face and attacked you. All right, so that guy did not belong in the party, and I don't know who he was or where he came from. Has, has he not been traveling with us the whole time? I I distinctly remember him being with us at parts over the last few days. He told me about his missing grandfather. Uh, he said he just wanted to help us, like I is. No, uh, I, my, my wounds disagree. When we all got up this morning at 2 a.m., and Soren came back with the information about the doll and the trail. There were only six of us sitting around that fire. There was no old guy. I don't know if he was dwarven or whatever, but there was not. That person does not exist. But I, I talked to him. <clears throat> he wanted to help us. Yeah, that kind of sums up my feelings on religion anyway. <laughs> oh, you want to be careful. Shut up for a moment. <sighs> I'm trying to find his scent. It's impossible to focus with all of you whining. Even with her enhanced senses and inhuman skills, the witch could not find the trail. The smell of decay, sweet and putrid, overwhelmed her wolf-keen senses, though it reduced over time. I don't think there was ever an extra dwarf. It was just this noxious smell of rot and copper. It's the... It's the... The, 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 the iron smell you were talking about earlier, is it like less now? It has lessened slightly. Uh, It's not right up in front of us, but it's still all around us. As if we were in the vicinity of one of those corpse cards. We do have the clear breath, isn't it? Did we take that? I thought we left everything there. No, we left the money, but we took the important goods. We aren't grave robbers, but some of these items are more useful to the living than the dead. If, I mean, if we want to give the the um, best use of this, then probably um, perhaps we can give it to our wolf companion, the Lady of Bunnies. Because <laughs> she's got the best sense of smell anyway, and if we can help clear it up for her, maybe she'll get more out of it. We, we, we don't... Because I certainly don't want it. We don't need to worry about core right now. We just... We need to hurry towards the, the, the campfire. We need to hurry. We need to get out of this forest as soon as we can. This is... We do, yeah. This is getting worse by the second, and I don't like it. Okay. Who, who, let's go, let's, let's start with the basis. Who's real? So we have a bunch of real people. I think there's uh, seven real people. No, there's six. Six. Six real people. Six people. Well, see, that's the confusing looking, thing. <laughs> I mean, the thing is about illusions is that they're not real, so you can put your hand through them. 
Also, if you look really carefully and you think you know it's an illusion, you can try and see through it. At least, you know, I've sh- heard I mean, tales of that. I should be able to smell if something's not real, right? In theory, if it's an illusion. I'm pretty sure my cousin's real, because, you know... I give Rowan an unnecessarily hard slap on the back. Of course we're both real. <laughs> oh, oh, you dick. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's do buddy system. <laughs> you are the only person that you have to keep the eye on of the other person, okay? So choose your buddy, and then let's go find these freaking kids, because we've had too many delays, and there's some creepy thing running around in this woods trying to slash us to death. Sound good? Oops. Hey, I see something in the distance. For a brief moment, Filgia witnessed the glint of three orbs staring back at the team from the shadows at the edge of her range of vision. It appeared mismatched, the socket holes now filled with discolored eyes, having been crudely cast into the cavities of the face. As Filgia blinked, the creature retreated deeper into the heavily wooded darkness and the cover of increasing rain. Okay, yeah, see, that's just, that makes it worse. Yeah. That I, makes it worse. I, 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 gra- <laughs> I grab Rovana and, like, pull her close to me. I'm like, okay, we're moving forward now. I agree. Everyone, everyone grab a body. Whoever's going to go be sneaky, go be sneaky with a partner, and then whoever isn't being sneaky, let's get going. Okay, Lady of Bunnies, with me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think we need to fix the people that are hanging out together. <laughs> I just re- no, 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 no. You, you and I work fine at the front. We'll go ahead. I mean, it will either you'll hit it with a hammer or I'll, I'll talk it to death. <laughs> We've got this. You are proficient at that. I am very proficient at that. Yeah. All right. Fine. Uh, well, s- right, we've got this. Let's just continue. We'll on. still sneak through the shadows. Inside of each other. <laughs> yeah. But no one else. Yeah. Okay, we're moving forward. I don't mind being in front so long as Soren doesn't mind being in front as well. Yeah, I can lead. Well, lead on. I'll keep uh, an eye out for spooky three lights in the mist. As the rain fell through the creaking boughs, the troop continued through the path for some time. Father Westpike, now ever cautious, spotted a dim glow through the distant trees. There, just a stone's throw ahead, along their chosen path burned a campfire. It popped and hissed in the light rain, sending smoke up past the high branches. Even at their distance, several of the loud, snapping and protesting pieces of wood could be heard. Hold up. This is it. This is where I saw the, uh, the three figures standing and found the doll. Okay, do you see any child-sized footprints, Soren? So far, Phlegia and I have only seen short groupings of footprints, not long sets or a larger group. Because so far, the ground hasn't been particularly conducive toward a continuous trail in a specific direction. It's been a single step here, uh, five or six paces there, a mix of uh, adults and children in patches. But the prints lead directly to this camp. The iron smell hasn't gone away, and it shows no sign of relenting. I can also smell the campfire and... A hint of fear, very faintly in the distance up ahead. Yaws, let's try to be sneaky, right? I'll follow you. 13 plus 7, 20. All right. Ooh. And what do you get, Kessie? I have six. Aha. All right. So you're not the quietest wolf. <laughs> you're, the, you're the wolf that steps in the branches and the leaves as they go by. It has been a while since I tried to be so sneaky. Ayas crept forward, hidden in the dark for the tailing trail. He quickly distanced himself from Filgia, whose ill-placed steps cracked branches and leaves underfoot, her body weary from being in wolf form. Okay, well... Let's see who's around the campfire. Okay. I see four figures warming themselves by the glow of the fire. Wait, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure one of them isn't sleeping. Rather, he's bound and hooded. Bound? Like it's a prisoner? With rope, yeah. It's an adult, and I believe that's where the scent of fear is coming from. All right, there were only three when I left. There's four now, and one of them doesn't want to be there. Is it a large don't want to be there, or a little don't want to be? Do you know what? It doesn't matter. They don't want to be there. (laughs) I'll take a closer look, too. What are they doing? They they appear to be sitting in proximity of the fire, but but not, not, not like they're warming themselves. Not really looking around the area but just sitting around and doing nothing. That's, that's weird and suspicious if 
you ask me. So were the last ones before they turned at us and ripped open their throats. Do we want to try, you know, <clears throat> I hate to mention it, talking to them first? Sounds right up your alley. <laughs> you can give it a go, Bard. <laughs> oh, no, 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 that, that's, I'm not saying that's my job, but maybe we ought to try to talk to him first, because uh, if we just kill him out of hand, we're not going to learn anything. Well, I think it's correct, Rowena. We should probably try to open a dialogue with him. And I trust that your tongue can actually make them more approachable. Mm-hmm. No, no pressure at all. <laughs> no. Um, I mean, I trust you, well, um, I don't really know most of you, but... You've got me back if everything goes wrong, right? Well, of course I do. And I've got you right by me, cuz, right? I slap your back uncomfortably hard again. Oh, <laughs> you've really got to stop doing that. Uh, what? Um, by the way, what are you, What kind of armor are you uh, wearing? Chainmail. It's loud as hell. Okay. Alright, so I assume you're just hitting me with your chainmail glove. Like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> just imagine that's gonna hurt. Alright. <laughs> I'm like, so, I mean, I can try talking to him, and if things go south, you guys have got us, right? We're good, right? Right behind you. Yep. I'm assuming two of us should flank either side, just in case. Definitely. I... Don't forget, go in your body, pet in your body system. Don't. Make sure we don't lose anyone. Lady of Bunnies and I are going to keep sneaking around. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Name. Wherever, <laughs> because we are doing the buddy system, wherever Soren wants to go to position himself, I'm just going to follow him. And Soren, where do you want to go, by the way? Yeah, I'll find a position just off to the side where I could get a good shot in an emergency. Just in the trees, maybe? I'll stay on the ground, though, so we don't have an embarrassing moment climbing down if they turn out to be friendly. I think. Are we going to go side by side, or should I be ahead a little bit? It's it's up to you. I mean, you could look like muscle, or we could look like we are travel like with well, we are traveling together. So I'm gonna leave it up to you. I mean, I think you should be a bit front until we've like reached ear. I think we should. I think, I think I should be up in front until we've reached like earshot range, like talking distance. That way, I can protect you with my shield if something goes awry. But the plan is for you to take the front when we start talking. Rowena and Father Westpike started toward the clearing, the larger of the dwarves in the lead. Shield held at the ready. Ice and Filgia, now hidden away in the woods, disappeared for the possible need for surprise. Soren and Sister Caverns fall headed left, around the edge of the central fire, to clear a position for Soren's ranged attacks. Rowena and Father Westpike continued onward, focusing their attentions on the people huddled around the fire. Oh no. I'm sorry, but no one checked for this. The crunch of sliding metal and the snap of shattering bone preceded an ear-splitting scream breaking the melodic rhythm of the falling rain and shaking free droplets from the resting place. It took Father Westpike a moment to recognize that the scream was his own before the shooting pain blinded him temporarily. No! Obscured by rows of trees, Sister Cavernsfall looked on in panic as her fellow dwarf screamed. She swung her warhammer back and forth over the ground before herself and in the clearing ahead. Great Saint Solars, we didn't check for traps! Across the clearing, unseen by all, Ayas checked his surroundings and cursed. Who puts a trap out here? The harrowed dwarf's leg ceased functioning as he realized the bloodied steel jaws biting deep into his leg. It did not seem like his body for a moment. The trickling blood washed away in the rain, the hole where the skin and metal looked so similar in the dull light. And he thought for a moment of how he could just take off the leg as it was not his and continue on his way. Then, Sanity tried to regain control. Oh, by all the lights! Ah! Beset by continued suffering and feeling, free of his ownership of the suffering limb, Father Westpike stood motionless, taking 20 points of stress damage. His leg had shattered, the blood was pooling, and he remained a sentinel in the dark, stunned. Cause shit! He is stunned by his suffering, I've seen this before, he's... People incapacitated by their pain, the sh- shock of it all, can't move, barely speak, exposed completely to attack. Oh god, no. Not while I'm here. I'll I've got you, I've got you. Uh can I be assisting or am I incapita capis- <laughs> You're incapitated for the uh, uh <laughs> incapitated. Uh my incapitated cousin. Um I got fifteen. As Rowena prided herself on her intent to protect her family, the rain drenched figures around the fire bolted up. They appeared human in height, though each of them hunched over, and with a swift motion drew out their weapons. The glint of metal in the firelight spurred Rowena to action. She stopped down in the metal latch of the trap, trying to pry open the claws, holding Father Westpike. It's gonna be okay, cuz just let me pull your leg out of this. Leave it be. 
I don't... I don't... Shut up. Though not a fighter, Rowena still had the strength of a dwarf. <laughs> With pain and blood, Father Fall Westpike's us. leg broke free of the trap, and Rowena could see the bones of his leg shine through on the other side of where the teeth tore away flesh. Pushing back the distraction, she lowered him onto a nearby bush, then tried to hide herself from the armed strangers. It was obvious to Rowena now that the scream and clashing trap had given away their position. The men approached, but as they passed a large bundle of pines, Filgia, her haunches raised, and her teeth bared, swung out before them. She growled and snapped, her intentions clear if the strangers continued their path. If anyone comes close, I'm gonna bite their face off. The leading stranger recoiled from the snap, while two others lunged forward to attack the witch. Senses alert, Filgia could see the slack drawn in their faces, and an empty, dull stare. Each of them attacked, glinted metal swinging, but only one made contact with the assaulting wolf. The short sword, worn and spotted with rust, slashed her shoulder and trickled blood into her black fur. The blood still fresh, the flesh just torn open. The first attacker stumbled as light erupted from the witch's wound. The crimson light of the hellish rebuke burned bright, strings of flame washing over the man until his features began to slosh and stretch, bubbling with steaming blood. To the disgust of the onlookers, his head popped open, and his body stumbled to the forest floor. A single long, pale claw pushed forth from the split in the man's skull. It raked against the ground, grasping a root, and pulled. More slender, clawed legs appeared, dragging a shriveled, oozing pustule out into the firelight. The thing increased in size as it crawled toward Filgia, rivulets of blood oozing down its countless folds. Though unafraid of violence, the unknown writhing mass before her cast doubt on her purpose, and if joining these people was the same thing to do. And she doubted her choices, doubted her abilities, and her grasp on reality. Her hair stood on end, watching the crawling thing. She thought of death, and how close it seemed, and of life, and what could be considered living. Was the thing before her truly alive? Had the man before she'd popped open his head? And in those moments of doubt, she felt ill-intentioned magics clawing at her mind, testing her brain for intelligence. I'm too smart for this. <laughs> she fought back, woman of the wilds, lady of bunnies, and pissed off wolf, pulling her mind back from the brink. She snapped and snarled, and the pustule clawing at the ground before her lashed out in anger, a thin red line crossing her snout. I cannot take much more of this alone. Get out there, Wolfie. But the evils of the forest had not yet sprung their surprises. Projectiles hailed down from the trees, brief flashing bolt tips headed for Father Westpike. The cleric, still stunned, was struck. A bolt landed on Father Westpike's chest, piercing through the chainmail just enough to puncture skin and muscle. The dwarf staggered, confused, pained, and still resting in the bush. Near the campfire, a tall individual with a commanding presence surveyed the battle, preparing a plan of action. He placed a small dagger from his hand into a well-stocked bandolier across his chest and proceeded to draw out two swords. Prepared and confident, he followed his fellow attackers toward the fray. That must be their leader. Stooped low, Ayas drew the curved rapier from his belt. He eyed the taller man contemplative. Should he aid the injured witch or use his unseen position to his advantage on their possible leader? It was then that the glowing pustule undulated. Its claws, poised to spring, saw the bloodied Filgia standing, wavering, alone. Well, that's that then. Decision made, Ayas dashed in, bringing the rapier down toward the pustulated brain. Ayas' slash cut through the pale creature, severing long clawed limbs. The only sound was that of snapping ligaments and spurting fluid. But in his mind, Ayas could hear a hideous shriek. Well, that's life, isn't it? Ayas backed away from the creature, snapping behind the cover of a nearby tree, his devilish grin beaming white in the firelight from ear to ear. Across the clearing, still hidden from view, Sister Cavern's fallen sword prepared to act. I'll target the leader, try to get an arrow into his ear canal, if at all possible. You should get in there, sister. I can't stay back here if I want to attack, so we're gonna have to break the buddy system, Soren. Within an hour of creating her system, Sister Cavern's fall broke her own rule leaving Soren behind in the trees and rushing to aid in the protection of her fellows. Goodbye. As she dashed forward, Soren took aim at the tall attacker's ear canal. With a keen aim but poor lighting, Soren's shot veered from its intended target. The arrow flew and fell sharp upon the leader's chest. He stopped momentarily, swaying, but his face remained a steady, unblinking scowl. 
as tears began to fall. As the arrow had flown, so had Sister Cavernsfall rushed into battle. Warhammer drawn, shield raised, she leapt before Philgia. In a single swoop, her warhammer crashing down upon the yellow-brained pustule of a thing, flattening it to the appearance of unleavened bread. <coughs> Disgusting. Ilmina, forgive me. Satisfied that the creature was dead, Sister Cavernsfall prepared her defense against the nearest enemy while uttering a prayer to Ilmina. She was cut off from her mantra as the hairs on her arms rose, and a booming voice from the treetops heralded the presence of magic. Weakness. Fear. Helplessness. Oh, 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 that's too cute to leave. I'm sorry, cuz. Rowena, with a soft spot for the witch's form, pulled out her hand harp and shuffled over to place a hand on the wolf's bloodied fur. With fast, twitching fingers, she strummed a melody and sent for her notes of magic. Be still a moment. Um, I'm gonna cast Cure Wounds. I don't want you to feel sad. Cut your wounds, they are not bad. Philgia looked up in excitement, wagging her tail as the pale light moved toward her skin from Rowena's hand. The light glowed beneath matted fur, binding itself to the witch's wounds. Though its work went unseen, Philgia could feel the flesh seal, and her vigor return. I look at her in excitement and wag my tail. <laughs> 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 Invigorated by her successful aid, Rowena turned back to her cousin, raising a fist in the air in momentary celebration, hoisting an unseen celebratory flagon. Yeah, I think we got this cause. Father Westpike, recovering from his stunned state, smiled, inspired by her courage and talent. My pillow, Rowena. You got this. Yeah. Her wounds healed, Philgia wasted no time jumping back into battle. She snarled, watching as one man took a poorly aimed swing at her front paws. She dodged back and could see the tall leader approaching, an arrow firmly in his chest, and tears in his unblinking eyes. You shouldn't have attacked us! The wolf lunged for the nearer man. She snapped her jaw shut over his leg, breaking through the hardened leather to taste blood beneath. She thrashed, causing the man to stumble and for the flesh to rip. Behind her, Father Westpike drew out his weapon, and using it as a cane to support his mangled leg, limped forth toward Philgia. I'll take them from here. You, the rest of you, please, just keep safe. By all that is just and good, may the Lord of Light guide our actions. Calling on the power of his faith, Father Westpike emanated the soft glow. He cast a blessing of Pelor upon them, surging Philgia, Ias, and Sister Caverns fall forward with renewed vigor. Sister Caverns fall, you're a frickin' badass. I am happy to help you, my friends. Trying to perceive the attackers in the trees, Father Westpike focused on the path of the arrows. Had he not been a dwarf, Accustomed to life in the darkness beneath stone and soil, he would have missed the three figures hiding in the trees just above the glow of the campfire. There, two he saw loading crossbows, the other gesturing, weaving evil magics in the darkness of the dead pines. Up there, the trees above the campfire. One is a mate. Please, somebody take care of it. The wizard stared out blankly, mumbling a final word. He cast his spell down into the party, past the fire, and a prickling sensation crept its way up Sister Cavern's false spine. For a moment, all was lost. She could see blades and bolts flying through the air, all meant for her, impossible to stop. But, filled with Ilmeter's endurance, she shook the feeling of dread and filled her mind with drive. To save her fellows, to find the children, to build the church, she growled. Whoever just tried to curse me is going to get smashed. Mind control. Mind control. That's what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. The men in the trees took aim at Father Westpike easy to discern as he glowed, and launched their bolts. Shield raised, Father Westpike heard them clash against metal and fall to the forest floor, but he was able to see the man on the ground charge and swipe at Philgia. The wolf, locked in battle, and having tasted blood, dodged the attack, the missing swipe audible to her astute ears. The leader sliced at Sister Cavern's fall in a series of quick but ineffective blows, and in a final attempt, he threw a dagger which flew just shy of Philgia's head. Still hiding out of sight, Bias, unaccustomed to such direct conflict, contemplated his next move. I'm also thinking mind control here, and part of me is waiting to keep those people alive so we can interrogate them. So I'm, uh, I'm thinking, well, I've got a whole load of rope. I mean, I've got a crossbow I could try and hit the mage with. Maybe the mage is controlling them all. What should I do? Believe in the power of iron. <laughs> Specifically iron crossbow bolts. Right. Eat bolts, wizard. <laughs> Highest lined up the perfect shot with his crossbow but the ever-increasing rain sent it off course, striking the mage in the shoulder. Man, you have a lot of weapons! 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. He's like a walking quartermaster. I'm a merchant. He's that tiefling. They've got weapon stores stashed everywhere. <laughs> I thank you not to be so racist. <laughs> he says that mid crossbow bolt and reloading. <laughs> uh. Remind me not to piss them off. <laughs> the leader has a second shot coming his way. With a swift shot, Soren sunk the arrow into the underside of the leader's arm as he took another swing towards Sister Cavern's fall. Ha <laughs> ha. I will hit that ear one of these days. Oh, that beautiful ear. <laughs> the mage is in the tree, but I don't really have anything that reaches into a tree, and I'm only four feet tall. Kill the tree. <laughs> well, now I feel like I have to finish off the leader. Well, go for it. All right. I still think we need to be able to interrogate them. Do not leave them. Interrogate the mage? Because it seems like a really bad idea to keep him alive. Yeah, I was going to go with that. So, let's, I mean, we could, I could at least take out a few. With a sickening crack. Sister Cavern's fall crashed her hammer into the knee of the human in front of her. A shattering of bones audible over the rain and clamor. Though momentarily doubled over, the man remained standing, eyes locked, unblinking on Sister Cavern's fall. It seemed like the tide of battle was turning. However, there was just one problem. Sorin, far behind the party, heard a phrase gently whispered into his ear, and his blood ran cold immediately. The half ma. Do you seek him? Sora knew who it was even before he turned to face the three hollow cavities, now stuffed with bloody, dripping eyeballs. The silent one slashed at Sora with disfigured talons, cutting open his forearms and digging into his chest. St. Solar, Sora! At the scream, Rowena sprung to her feet, abandoning her safe space behind the Woman of the Wilds and rushing toward the clearing. With intent and power, she strummed the strings of the harp and sung, You'll soon hate and you'll fear the sound that you hear. A wave of thunder swept up along the tree line. As branches shook, one of the men fell from his perch, his ankle popping as he hit the floor. Her planned successful Rowena doubled back to hide amongst the trees. Aided by the bard's magic, Filgia lashed out again at the man nearest her. The man moved his blade defensively, but at the last moment his footing slipped and her fangs sunk in. Filgia, leg in her grip, tackled him to the ground, shifting her bite. She tore at his face and neck, tearing away pieces of flesh. But as another of the foul pustules crawled out of his ear, she couldn't help but back away in disgust. Where is Sora? Father Westpike spun around. He could hear commotion behind him, hidden in the darkness of the trees. Frick. He set off limping for the wood, shield in one hand, hammer in the crutch of his other. As Soren came into view, so did the lanky outline of the silent one, its claws deep in Soren's chest. Mumbling low, Father Westpike cast a sacred flame upon the beast. Father of Light, burn away the darkness with your sacred radiance. Be gone, foul creature! As he prayed for divine aid, a beam of light shot down from the sky, a spark from the heavens illuminating the foul creature for a split second, burning with a splendid radiance. One of the eyes in its face continued to burn after the light dissipated, and surprised by this unexpected turn of events, the silent one screeched and fled into the darkness of the woods. Oh, that worked? Okay. <laughs> Good job. Ah, hello! The human leader initiated another series of strikes and counter strikes with Sister Cavern's fall, but the whole of their exchange lasted mere moments, and as each stepped back before re engaging, Sister Cavern's fall was beset by a sharp, stinging pain in her left bicep and shoulder. She saw blood. Weakness, fear, helplessness. Across the clearing, the booming voice from the trees repeated its incantation. In that instant, Filgia felt the fur on her neck stand on end, doubt and dread weaving its way through her mind. Facing down her enemies, wounded and angered, she steeled herself from the wills of the mage. Filgia shook off the feeling and focused on the emerging creature before her. She dodged, small, sharp limbs lashing out. Two bolts from near the campfire missed their intended targets as the brain-like abominations before the team undulated and quivered, shaking their central bulbous masses towards Sister Cavern's fall. I fear no evil. Sister Cavern's fall could feel the creature forcing a path into her mind, her psyche, but she focused, thinking only on the pain of her wounds, the suffering of her fellows, until the intrusion on her thoughts retreated. Ilmater, forgive the suffering I will cause. I'm gonna go mage hunting. Ias, seeing the shot, move forward with his crossbow drawn. Was that actually a natural 20? It was, yeah. Okay, please roll Hell a d100. Yeah. Hmm? What? Roll a 100-sided dice. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just, you know, it's digital. Just roll a 100-sided dice. Okay. You got this. 90. As the first bolt caught the mage in the chest, he dropped something small from his perch. It shattered upon impact with the ground below, and the mage scowled. 
Reloading with lightning speed, Hyas took aim again. I got another natural 20. <laughs> Hell yeah. Please roll another percentage, 100. <laughs> See 100. another 90, please. <laughs> it doesn't have any more bonus actions. 29. The second shot found its mark in the man's ear canal, impacting with a squish. As the mage collapsed from the tree and his head hit the ground, a pustule creature burst forth from his nostrils, ripping itself free from his face and increasing in size with each passing second. Where's my son? As Aias raged, Soren took aim at the tall man. Soren now expected a pustule creature to come from the leader's head if he killed him, but he knew they'd be prepared. He lined up a shot, and as the man slashed at Sister Cavern's fall, Soren's arrow caught him off guard, pierced through his ear at an angle, exiting through the nostril. Perfect. Another pustule, covered in a splattering of hardened congealed blood, used the opening to escape from the remains of the man's head. Thankful for the aid, Sister Cavern's fall stepped over the body, hammer raised, and with force and steel, the pustule was flattened. A strange dark liquid splashed from its wounds as she pulled her weapon back. The creature still moved. Drawing her crossbow, Rowena rushed back to Father Westpike. There, protected by his shield, she let loose a bolt for the fallen archer. The archer, riding himself from his fall, his crossbow sights aimed for Rowena, felt the catch in his throat. A warmth spread through him, and he gasped in weakened breaths. His grip fell loose. Rowena's bolt hit loose first, flying through the camp and embedding in his throat. Rowena paused, happy for her lucky shot, until the man pulled forth a dagger and cut open his own neck, releasing a crawling, skittering pustule from within. That's gross. You... you already squished one of these bugs. You've got this. Rowena glanced at Sister Cavern's fall, who, upon seeing the new creature, felt both determination and inspired to continue her assault. All right, bring me to those abominations. They won't last long. These things probably taste disgusting. I wouldn't try to bite them, witch. The wolf silently nodded and moved to attack with its sharpened black claws, leaping toward the nearest pustule. Filgia pinned the pustule, scratching at the creature repeatedly, smearing its putrid brain matter into the dirt. Perfect. A few feet away, <laughs> Father Westpike glanced back to Soren. Soren, please move closer to the group. That thing is still out there. The old cleric limped back into the fight, hammer raised to strike. With a combination of fury and bardic inspiration, Father Westpike bludgeoned the newest pustule, part of the brain-like mass crushing under impact. The brain undulated and writhed, as its fellow creatures had, and attempted to infiltrate the minds of the two devout attackers. Sister Cavern's fall could feel a familiar itch along her thoughts, and Father Westpike faced a new experience to test the strength of his mind. Stay out of my head! Nice. We've been very lucky. It's because we're so damn smart in our family. We're all good. St. Soller, give me strength. The hero overcame the battle of wills, but distracted, Father Westpike could not stop a slashing claw from further opening up the flesh on his leg. Still in the tree, the final crossbowman loosed a show, streaked past Father Westpike, unnoticed, as the final pustule undulated at Rowena, clawing at her mind. I blatantly cursed myself. I said our family was smart. It's not the smartest thing to say, clearly. Rowena's head ached, then burned, then throbbed with stinging pain. The pressure grew and her mind sank into thick mud. Her thoughts went incomplete, her aptitude for music lost. The creature burrowed into her mind. She could not move, she could not think. Standing, paralyzed, its battle of the minds had won. Pustule jumped onto her arm and climbed toward her head. I can help with that. I'm good with the canals. It's just a brain, it has no nerves. No, don't hit me! What are you doing? Aim the crossbow and... Put that crossbow away! Oh no, that's no good. Stop pointing that thing at me. Don't forget the blessing of Pelor. Yeah, might as well. The gods might as well be useful for something. Make this shot hit, yada yada yada. Burn. <laughs> as he gets a one. That's right. <laughs> as I get a one. <laughs> yeah, the gods don't seem to be much help anyway. Sacrilege won't get you far, friend. Aias's shot fired. And though the gods did not wish to aid Aias, his misplaced shot avoided Rowena's face. Still watching from afar, Soren jumped from his perch to approach the battlefield from the flank. Time for me to move closer to take a better shot at one of those pustules. Soren jogged swiftly into place, notching an arrow, lining up the perfect shot. However, he failed to notice the metal jaws lying in his path. And as he took his next step, he was not able to feel the different texture, and his mind raced. His limbs reacted faster than his thoughts, though, pulling back just before the clash of metal snapped shut. Father Westpike shivered unconsciously at the sound, pain in his leg all the more real to him. Soren, still intent upon attack, 
lined up the shot a second time, his position uncompromised. But his mind, still distracted by the close encounters with the steel jaws of the trap, his bolt nearly grazing one of the freakish creatures. Perfect. There's definitely a Vietnam flashback where I hear the clink and the chunk. I'm just like, oh no, not again! <laughs> Time to crush a bug. <laughs> a smile unlike that of a godly woman flickered over Sister Cavern's false lips, and her grip tightened on the warhammer. Her hand guided by the blessing of the gods, she swung from below, <laughs> the impact sending the pustule catapulting off into the distant dead trees. As Father Westpike watched the dark shape fly off beyond his sight, he found himself mirroring the triumphant smile at Sister Cavern's fall war. Rowena, her mind fighting back, tried to whisper for help, but nothing came out. As the pustule inched higher and higher, perched on her shoulder now, her body took action all on its own. Yet it wasn't her body at all, but the heavy cloak, the dark shroud draped around her shoulders. The single metal clasp dug into Rowena's flesh, anchoring itself and allowing the long flowing cloth to wrap around the pustule. It clenched and tightened, the cloak's noose squeezing until the pustule hissed and screeched, then split in two. The halves squelched onto the forest floor. Oh, excellent. Rowena felt the fog lift from her mind, and she saw Father Westpike dashing toward her, hammer raised. <laughs> Don't hit me, it's dead! Don't hit me, it's dead! Wait, what? Stop trying to hit me, it's dead! Oh, yeah, she killed it with the shroud. Oh, wow. Please don't hit me! I'm sorry, the sound of the bear trap must have triggered something. As Rowena's mind recovered, she still felt slightly weakened. Her face was pale, her eyes sunken ever so slightly. But the shroud around her shoulders seemed more vibrant, its gold thread glistening, its fibers flat and oiled. Rowena, making to straighten herself after such an attack, verified with side-eyed glances that no one noticed her cloak's previous actions. Philgia, focusing on the final posture, jumped forward into position, only to react by reflex as an arrow flew by, pinning the pustule to a tree. Surprise! It twitched. Then, nothing. I don't know what came over. Again, I'm sorry. Quiet overtook the sight, and heavy breaths could be heard from the wounded and the weary. All right. Is that mage still alive? Can we question him? No, he's very dead. Ah, oh, darn. Oh, well, I guess that's good. All right. I'll make sure of that. <laughs> Not just a little, he's very dead. All right, very dead. Super dead. Both ear canals gone and everything. Yep. So they stood, bleeding, bloodied, and beaten. Corpses at their feet, trees splattered with ichor and clinging stench. The campfire flickered and the rain fell, caring not for the struggle or for the lost children somewhere else in the dead pines. The moment to breathe let realization set in. Some had seen more death tonight than many had seen a lifetime. Rowena worried, her mind still reeling from the invasion on her will, from unknown creatures which now lay dead and broken in the clearing. There was a squelch of flesh as Soren retrieved an arrow, and the group gathered together outside of the ring of the fire's warmth. The fire still hissed, weak but alive. There, still near the flickering flames, the hooded captive wheezed and shook. Father Westpike moved to approach, seeing the one good thing left to do on such a terrible night. But Sister Cavern's fall flashed back to the suffering woman, the creature that crawled out from within. She touched it in her cheek, thinking of the tearing flesh that freed the silent one. There, splattered across her face, she felt the dark, viscous innards of the flattened creature before her. She wiped it away, but stopped at the sound of a wheezing chuckle, so faint in the dead pines. She glanced back at her fellows and met the worried gaze of Soren. It was clear that he also heard it. Somewhere, out there, the children were in danger, but so were they. Dark Dice, Chapter 2, Mindless. Starring Caitlin Statz as Sister Savarite Caverns Fall, Peter Lewis as Soren Arkwright, Ethor Vithyarsson as Sindri Westpike, David Alt as Ayas Hinskeep, Kessie Rilinicki as Filgia the Witch, Hem Cleveland as Lady Rowena Granite Pike, and Travis Vengroff as Dungeon Master, featuring guest voice Paul Maya as the Wizard, with writing assistance from K.A. Stats and transcriptions by Hem Cleveland. This episode was co-edited by Neil Martin and Travis Vengroff, produced, edited, and with sound design by Travis Vengroff, and mixed and mastered by Sarah Baczynski. Episode 2 features music by Travis Vengroff, Enzo Puzovio, and Josh Barron. All music was mixed and mastered by Brandon Strader. To find more RPG podcasts that showcase diversity through its players, please check out RPGcasts.com. 
If you're also looking for a new podcast app, we highly recommend Himalaya. This is a Fool and Scholar production. Thank you for listening.